Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I think Jane's given uh, a very good uh, introduction. So without further ado, we'll just go to the next uh, slide, please. So uh, as usual, I'll be taking you through uh, some uh, some slides on surveillance data on COVID-19 in our community. This graph shows the number of new cases of COVID-19 reported per day among Halton residents over the course of the pandemic. By end of day on January the 18th, uh, which we have the latest data, we had 7,639 cases of COVID-19 that have been diagnosed among Halton residents. This includes 439 active cases and 146 deaths to date. As we've seen in past presentations in wave one, the seven day rolling average peaked in April, then began to decline and remained low over the summer. That average then began to increase again in September, marking the start of the second wave and increased steadily until the first wave, uh, first week of January. Over the past week, we have seen a decrease in the seven day average and our case counts, and we are cautiously optimistic. However, it is important to note that there may be some reporting delays for the most recent data. Currently, the seven day average is sitting at 73 new cases per day. Next slide, please. When looking at the same graph zoomed in to focus on the past 30 days, the seven day rolling average of new cases came to a peak in early January and has since returned to pre-holiday values. On December the 19th, 30 days ago, the seven day average was 75 new cases per day, which is similar to the average of 73 cases per day that we are seeing today. When looking at the total number of cases since September 1st, approximately 41% of them have occurred in the past 30 days alone. This 30 day period covers the days leading up to the holidays, the holiday period itself, and the few weeks following, thereby likely covering the two week incubation period for most new infections resulting from any holiday gatherings at the end of December. Next slide, please. So as you'll note, the weekly rate of COVID has been increasing steadily and then more quickly over the fall of 2020. We have seen the weekly incidence rate double roughly once per month during the second wave. And I talked about this at my last presentation. So by the end of September, it was approximately 15 per 100,000. By the end of October, it was approximately 30 per 100,000. By the end of November, it was approximately 60 per 100,000. And by the end of December, it was approximately 110 per 100,000. While the increasing trend of wave two has been worrisome, we have recently seen a decrease in our case counts and our incidence rates. As mentioned with the case counts, we're cautiously optimistic, but being part of the greater Toronto Hamilton area, we also must see a reduction in rates in our neighboring areas to feel a true impact. Next slide, please. This graph shows the weekly age specific rates be, uh, since the beginning of the second wave. In other words, it's showing how many new cases were reported each week in a particular age group, divided by the number of Halton residents who are in that age group, and then multiplied by 100,000. The rate of new cases has increased across all age groups during the second wave, coming to a peak in early January. While the rate is currently highest amongst our most vulnerable residents, those aged 80 plus shown in dark blue, residents aged 20 to 39 and 40 to 59 shown in green and orange are still presenting the greatest volume of cases since they account for a greater proportion of our overall population. Residents 20 to 39 and 40 to 59 years of age have also experienced the greatest increase in overall case counts during the second wave. Next slide, please. This graph shows the percent positivity by age in, since the beginning of the second wave. In other words, it shows the proportion of residents who tested positive for COVID-19 among all those in a particular age group who were tested that week. The percent positivity has consistently increased across all age groups over the last four months. Since the week of November 1st, the percent positivity has been above the threshold of 2.5% across all age groups. 
Consistent with the provincial modeling released on January 12th, the percent positivity increases occurred despite strong testing volumes. This means the increased percent positivity likely reflect a true increased spread of COVID-19 within our community, rather than being an artifact of changes in testing behavior or patterns. The increase in percent positivity over the last two months has been the greatest among younger age groups. Next slide, please. This graph shows the number of COVID-19 outbreaks active each day between April 1st, the day that the first outbreak was declared in Halton, and January 18th. The majority of COVID-19 outbreaks in Halton have been in institutional settings, such as long-term care homes, retirement homes, and hospitals. In total, 185 outbreaks of COVID-19 have been declared in Halton since the start of the, of the pandemic, with the majority of those declared just since the beginning of September 1st. As of January 18th, there are 36 active outbreaks, 14 active in institutions, 11 in congregate living settings, 10 in workplace or community settings, and one in childcare. There are currently no open outbreaks in school settings. Next slide, please. The number of inpatients at Halton hospitals with confirmed COVID-19 has also followed a similar pattern to cases, but we know that the occupancy of hospital beds increases with a time lag of several weeks. This reflects the delay between the diagnosis of COVID-19 and the experience of severe effects that lead to hospitalization. This graph provides the breakdown by hospital with the three Halton healthcare sites in Oakville, Georgetown and Milton, as well as the Joseph Brandt Hospital and, and the Joseph Brandt Pandemic Response Unit in Burlington. During the second wave, we have seen a climb in the number of beds occupied by confirmed COVID-19 cases. The current peak occurred over the holidays, in particular between Jan uh, December 25th and January 3rd. We reached an all-time high on January 2nd when there were 73 inpatients in Halton hospitals with COVID-19. Similar to the trends in cases and rates, we have seen a decrease since the beginning of January in the number of beds occupied by confirmed COVID-19 cases. For the most recent day for which data are available, there were 56 inpatients in Halton hospitals with confirmed COVID-19. This represents a 22% increase in the number of patients with COVID in Halton hospitals over the last four weeks. Among the 56 uh, cases currently in hospital, 25 or close to 50% are in the ICU. At the time, a, uh, a snapshot of inpatient demographic data provided to us by the hospitals was taken on January the 18th. 47% of COVID-19 patients were Halton residents, meaning their primary residence is a Halton address, while 53% lived outside Halton. 45% were age 80 plus, with the remaining 55% between the ages of 40 to 79. Only 9% were known to reside in long-term care. Next slide, please. This graph shows the cumulative number of deaths among COVID-19 cases in Halton over time. Similar to the hospitalizations, the number of deaths among COVID-19 cases was somewhat delayed relative to case onset, with most deaths in the first wave occurring in April and May following increased outbreak activity in Halton institutions. Over the summer, there were no new deaths at all, leading to the prolonged plateau at 25 deaths from July to September that you see on this graph. Unfortunately, since the beginning of October, 121 new deaths have occurred, raising the death toll in Halton from 25 to 146. Overall, 112 of our 146 deaths have been among residents aged 80 plus, but the other 34 deaths occurred among residents aged 40 to 79, meaning younger individuals are not exempt from the risk of death associated with COVID-19. 119 of the 146 deaths have been among people living in institutions. Um, sorry. Uh, ha sorry. 119 of the 146 deaths have been among people living in institutions, primarily long term care and retirement homes. Next slide, please. The relationship between outbreaks, 
hospitalizations and deaths is often discussed, with many assuming that since most deaths are among elderly residents of institutions, these individuals are also the COVID-19 patients occupying hospital beds shown on a previous slide. In fact, looking at the graph on the left side of the slide, among our deceased cases who were institutional residents, just 39% of them were reported to have been hospitalized, meaning the majority likely died in their long-term care or retirement homes. Conversely, almost all of the Halton cases who passed away and were not institutional residents were reported to have been hospitalized. Looking at the graph on the right side of the slide now, which shows the outcome among all Halton cases who have ever been hospitalized, you can see in fact the majority of hospitalized cases are now resolved or active, 71% in blue, with only 20% in green having passed away. This means the relationship between institutional outbreaks, hospitalizations, and death is not as strong as many assume. And so while the vaccination efforts we are currently undertaking in long-term care and retirement homes should reduce the tragic increase in deaths we have seen uh, in those facilities, we may not see the number of hospitalizations decrease significantly until we are either able to control the epidemic through the lockdown and other public health measures, or be able to vaccinate the broader community since community cases are often the ones occupying hospital beds. Lastly, when reporting on deaths, it's important to continue to remember that each of these deaths represents a tragic loss for the loved ones and our community. Next slide, please. The ability to distinguish between cases who have ever been hospitalized and those who have not, similar to the graph on the previous slide, is a new addition to our COVID-19 dashboard on Halton.ca starting today. The new filter on the case demographics tab will reflect the hospitalization experience of cases who are Halton residents and who have been hospitalized anywhere. But the information is subject to public health being notified about hospitalizations among Halton residents, which does not always occur or may occur with some delay. This is different from the count of COVID-19 cases currently in Halton hospitals shown on our monitoring indicators tab, which currently reflects the data reported daily by hospitals and includes both Halton residents and non-Halton residents in their care to help better understand local health system capacity and the impact COVID-19 is having on it. Another change um, to the dashboard launching today is the addition of options to view the data on the neighborhood map based on cases reported in the last 90 days and the last 30 days only. Both of these changes are being made in response to, such a, to suggestions made at the last council meeting, which I thank you for. Finally, a, uh, just a small note that the weekly rate on the monitoring indicators tab will now be calculated using a slightly revised 2020 population estimate for Halton of 610,581 people. This was released by Stats Canada just last week. Previously, the estimate was 619,087 people. Next slide, please. As we've discussed at previous regional council meetings, higher case counts affects our ability to do full case management and contact tracing. In order to meet the ministry target of 90% of cases reached in 24 hours, a streamlined approach to case and contact management was undertaken. On January the 6th, we introduced an abbreviated one call case management process that aims to expedite case management while still collecting key information. So far, 800 cases or about 10% of the total have received abbreviated case management. Next slide. Before detailing our current process for case and contact management, I would like to acknowledge that we have been hiring more staff to support this area over the course of the second wave. Nine new staff in this month alone. We're also very grateful for the support received from the Ministry of Health to date with the addition of 18 staff to support case and contact management. Lastly, we're also excited to be one of the first local public health units to use the virtual assistant tool to uh, ensure that we are receiving contact information. These are very good news stories for us in Halton. 
Still, to meet ministry requirements of 90% of cases reached in 24 hours, our streamlined approach involves contacting all Halton residents who tested positive for COVID-19 through a phone call from Halton Region Public Health. We are happy to share that we are currently reaching 91% of cases within 24 hours. We now provide a single phone call to notify the case of their positive test result, provide them with vital information on how to self-isolate and notify their close contacts, and also to collect critical information from them like symptoms, their occupation, and if they have been to any high-risk settings while infectious. We also send a follow-up email with detailed instructions to each case. For cases who agree to participate in the virtual assistant platform, Contacts they enter into this platform are sent to Public Health Ontario for telephone follow-up. Cases are now required to notify their own public, uh, personal high-risk close contacts and provide them with a detailed instruction email from Halton Region Public Health. Halton Region Public Health provides teaching to the case on how to identify these high-risk close contacts to help facilitate this process. However, this abbreviated case management process does not allow us to collect information on all contacts, and thus we will no longer be reporting on the percent of contacts reached within 24 hours. We continue to prioritize and manage contact tracing in high-risk settings, such as long-term care homes, congregate settings, childcare and schools in partnership with the organizations involved. Next slide, please. With respect to workplaces, we are prioritizing high-risk workplaces. Our outbreak team continues to support contact management for workplaces like long-term care homes, congregate settings, industrial workplaces, childcare, schools, hospitals, and first responders. Contact management in all other workplaces is the responsibility of the employer. Halton Region provides the case a workplace instruction letter and a contact instruction letter from Halton Region to share with their employer. And additional information is available at halton.ca. My staff and I are grateful to work in such close partnership with the business community to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in Halton and beyond. Next slide, please. In order to reduce workplace outbreaks, it's imperative that workers who have symptoms of COVID-19 are identified as high-risk exposure contacts or are diagnosed with COVID-19 do not attend work. For individuals who do not have paid sick time through their employer, the federal government does offer the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit. It provides income support to employed and self-employed individuals who are unable to work because they are sick or need to self-isolate due to COVID-19 or have an underlying health condition that puts them at greater risk of getting COVID-19. It provides $500 a week for up to two weeks. It can take as little as three days or as many as 28 days from application submission to receive this benefit, depending on the documentation required by the federal government and the method of payment. However, to truly enable workers to stay home when sick during the, this pandemic and to prevent the spread of other communicable diseases in the future, a provincial policy is needed for paid sick days. This would allow pay to show up exp uh, as expected directly to employee paychecks. It would also provide job security while taking time off. Currently, provincial employment standards do not require paid sick days. In Canada, the most recent data available reveals that 58% of workers in Canada and over 70% of workers making less than $25,000 per year have no access to paid sick days. The gap in access to paid sick days affects several groups disproportionately, namely women, low age and precarious workers, racialized communities and immunocompromised people. This list is almost comparable to those to whom COVID-19 may affect disproportionately, particularly racialized and low income workers. Recently, the Decent Work and Health Network, a non-government organization of health providers who specialize in the intersection of work and health, have been advocating for evidence-based improvements to the employment standards to improve individual and community health. They have developed the following core principles for paid sick leave policy, universal, paid, permanent, adequate, and 
accessible. These principles align very well with the equity approach we are guided by in public health through the Ontario Public Health Standards. Staying home when sick is the most effective containment tool we have for COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. It's why I issued the Section 22 class order in Halton. However, without strong public policy to support this, our ability to contain the spread is compromised. It is vital that people should not have to choose between food on their table versus spreading COVID at their workplace. My deep thanks to Regional Council for the resolution that was just passed today. While we continue to work together and support each other to take actions on this that will uh, on things that will limit the spread of COVID-19, there is now a light at the end of the tunnel, the COVID-19 vaccine.